This is a production of Cornell University. Thank you so much for having me. This in, in 25 years is the first time that I give a formal talk here uh, in front of my, my colleagues and my peers. So thank you so much for having me doing this today. So basically what I will uh, show you is uh, the work that I have been done for the last 15 or 20 years actually. I started this uh, work when I was an undergrad student, then I got a master's studying fossils from Patagonia. Then I have elapsed when I came here as a postdoc and then uh, when it was time for me to reestablish my own research program, I went back to Argentina. Um, Something that is really important for me is collaboration, and this is part of my team. I have uh, my um, colleagues from Argentina, uh, colleagues from here. Uh, Liz was a student here at Cornell University. Now she is my collaborator. She is in Ohio. Uh, my colleague Peter Wilf, uh, he works in Penn, in Penn State, and of course uh, my uh, crew of people that help me when we are in the field. So this project is basically a collaboration with several institutions, not just from Cornell and United States, but also from Argentina. So one of the things that is important to understand is uh, why are fossils important? And one of the things that we need to concentrate is actually in the global diversity uh, through uh, the world. Something that most people don't know is that the Northern Hemisphere is characterized for being continental. What means that? That means that 30% of land is in the Northern Hemisphere, 70% is water. Southern Hemisphere is characterized for being oceanic. That is because only 6% of land masses is what is formed the Southern Hemisphere. And if you consider the part of land that is between the two tropics, the Northern Hemisphere is represented by one-to-one -one land and water, and the Southern Hemisphere is one to 16, so only one part of land records 16% of water. Something that is interesting about this is the fact that of the six considered to be six hotspots for diversity, fall into the Southern Hemisphere. And this is actually indicating that definitely there's an asymmetry in the diversity of uh, plants and uh, biomes in general. This latitudinal diversity, it's not new. It's not just in the modern times. We know that the equatorial peaks in the species richness are typical not only for plants, they are also for terrestrial and marine animals as well. We know that has increased dramatically through the Cretaceous to the Cenozoic, and that is because we have the great appear, appearance of the vascular plants and the angiosperms and gymnosperms there. And that we have various <coughs> late Cenozoic to Neogene vicarious events that effectively partition the tropics in centers of high diversity. So we see these peaks since the Ordovician, they are coming up and they peak actually with the appearance of the flowering plants during some place here in the Cretaceous around 140 million years ago. So what happened with the Americas? This, is, this talk is about Patagonia, so I'm, I'm trying to go towards there. So what happened with the Americas? In United States, it has approximately 10 million square kilometers. It has 7% of the global diversity at the angiosperm level, and 1.4 are considered to be endemic. However, if we look at Brazil, that is smaller than the United States, actually carries 20% uh, of the global diversity. Of those, 66% are endemic. And we know that it's a fact that around 40% of the, of the uh, Amazon basin has never been sampled. Therefore, we expect to have much more endemic plants there than we know up to date. And what happened with Argentina where Patagonia is located? Argentina is actually almost uh, one third of the size of United States. It only has 3% of the global angiosperm diversity and has 
0.5% of endemics. But if you consider this half of the size is approximately has the same number of endemics that the uh, United States. So we observe this diversity uh, asymmetry also if we look at the Americas in general. So coming from South America, it's important for me to explain what South America is about. Uh, more or less, we have 90,000 vascular plant species, of which in Antarctica only has two of them. But South America and Antarctica are really critical, are extremely critical to understand and comprehend several factors about plants. First, explain the direction and flow of the dispersion and migration routes of all these plants and also animals. Explain the radiation and dominance of the angiospheres in the southern <coughs> hemisphere in general. And also helps to interpret the distant model of the modern astral distribution. And this is because South America was part of the big continent called Gondwana. So just to show you, Antarctica is uh, during the summer, it has only 2% free of snow is the coldest, windiest, and driest desert on the planet, and has only two vascular plants, Columbantus, which is in the Caryophyllaceae, and the Schamsia, which is a grass. Argentina is only uh, a thousand miles exactly for the Antarctic Peninsula, so it's only 1,600 kilometers from the Antarctic Peninsula to the southernmost city, of uh, Argentina, which is Ushuaia. And actually it has high diversity. It has families are represented 215. We have approximately 2000 genera and around 2000, uh, around 9,000 uh, species of uh, vascular plants. And of, the, oops, of these, 1,800 are endemics. They are only found in Argentina. So what is Patagonia? Patagonia is basically the last thousand miles of the southernmost tip of South America. Uh, it's considered to be largely inhabited. And I, the uh, population is around uh, four people per kilometer square. So when you go there, mostly you don't see people around. Uh, if you divide Patagonia using the Andes, uh, you will have two different type of uh, environments in general. The steppe or the Patagonian steppe, which is actually flat, dry plain, mostly are grasslands. And if you look at the uh, border with uh, Chile and the Andes, what you will see are mountain sides that are covered by rainforests. Uh, that's where we have the numerous uh, glaciers um, that um, extend on both sides, on the Argentinian side and the um, Chilean side. So the term Patagonia comes from actually the first Spaniards that arrived there around 1500s. They saw these big uh, Indians called uh, the Welches. And the Tewelches were very tall men, up to two meters, and they were look higher and taller due to the fact that they wear a lot of pelts from guanacos to cover themselves. And also because they use those to cover their feet. So what they see, the footstep that the Spaniards saw were the ones used by these, by these um, uh, natives. So the name Patagonia comes from there. However, <coughs> Charles Darwin, during the trip uh, to the big, the big old trip with uh, Fitzroy in commanding, uh, landed in Patagonia. He was only 24 years old. And the first impression of Patagonia was exactly this, is the surface in quite level and is composed of well-rounded single mix with the whitest earth. Here and there, a scattered tuft of brown wiry grass are supported and it's still really some low thorny bushes. And actually that's exactly what Patagonia is. 
So we have a huge, um, this is uh, prepared, um, Kevin, this is one of Kevin's slides, and actually um, it's just to show that that was his vision, is not how Patagonia is. Patagonia is extremely rich in uh, vascular plants and extremely endemic. So we have different type of biomes, and just I will show you only a couple of them. I will show you materials from the steppe and materials that you will see close to the Valdivian forest. So if you were looking at the steppe extant flora, oh, sorry, if you were looking at the side of the Andes, what you will see are these spectacular views. These are mostly big lakes with uh, volcanoes, uh, covered by beautiful uh, forests of Nothofagus and Guaymanias and Calcluvias. And also, if you have the chance, you can see the uh, Perito Moreno Glacier, which is one of the most active glaciers uh, in modern times. And these are some of the endemics. Uh, we have Embotrium in, in Proteaceae, we have Notophagaceae, uh, Luma is uh, a Mutaceae, which uh, lack of uh, bark, as many of the Mutaceae. We have the typical Araucaria in the Araucariaceae, Escalonia, and Dreamies in the uh, Winteraceae. But if you go to the steppe, you have the opportunity to see, meanwhile you are walking, penguins. <laughs> <coughs> Uh, you can see also other kind of wildlife such as uh, uh, marines, um, well, it went out of my mind, it's not important, but uh, you can also see uh, different type of bushes and brushes. And some of those are these, for example, Larea in the Sea of uh, We have beautiful legumes, Aranatrophilum. We have some of the most uh, spectacular cacti. And we have, these are endemics, we have Chukiraga, which is one of the composites. Okay. These, uh, this next two slides are photos that I took, meanwhile I was walking from the track to one of my sites. So, and that was a walk of less than one kilometer. So it's really very rich if you are looking down. Uh, Patagonia has all kinds of bushes and brushes, but the, the trick is to look on the ground. So we see things like ephedra, oxalidaceae, uh, we see tropaliaceae, like calciolaria, uh, ramnaceae in the Coliwaja, this is a, uh, one of the endemics, another cacti, azorellas, uh, Loa Seisi, another composite, Apiaceae. Another ones like Enotera, a bunch of legumes, and several monocots. So this is just from the walk from the track to one of my sites. So the, the flora is incredible. And then, also, meanwhile, you are collecting, you are really lucky on seeing a lot of wildlife, such as condors, guanacos, penguins, and rias. These are uh, uh, flightless uh, birds. So, how did Patagonia reach the high diversity, the present flora? To answer that question definitely, we need to look at the fossil record. Fossils are extremely important, not just to check for endemics or not just to explain modern distribution, but they actually provide additional information to assess homology and evolutionary change through time. They also provide character evidence that affect our phylogenetic conclusions. So one of the things that we do is include all these fossils within the phylogenetic analysis. That helps us to understand modern relationship, not child's past relationships. Fossils also help to estimate the minimal ages of certain clays that they are present on. And those definitely are the best source for calibration for molecular dating. Finally, they also help to understand the evidence of past distribution. Therefore, they can aid us to understand biogeographic histories 
not only from the past, but also from the present. So we have several papers in which we've been utilizing the fossil record to answer different questions. For example, we provide a list of monocots that are suitable for molecular dating analysis. We also study the Cenozoic biogeographical evolution of woody plants. Uh, we are able to understand phylogenetic biome conservatism if we look at the fossil record comparing them with extant material. And finally, we are able to do some uh, testing to impact of how we do calibration uh, uh, treatments using fossils. So fossils really are key for any kind of study that you want to do. So the research questions, these are the big research questions that we have in, in my group, um, are basically based on Patagonia. And one of the questions we have is, was Patagonia a refuge from the end of Cretaceous max extinction? And I will we'll go to that in a little bit. If you remember, during the KPG boundary was a mass extinction. Many vertebrates group disappear, many plants disappear. However, the event is completely different in the Northern Hemisphere than the Southern Hemisphere. And why is that? Because again, we have that differences in the top, the Northern Hemisphere being continental, the Southern Hemisphere being oceanic. What are the composition, diversity, and biogeography affinities of early Paleocene Eocene flora? And why is this important? Because if we have mass extinction at the end of the Cretaceous, we need to have something at the beginning of the Paleogene. So we are interested in Denian floras, which is the, south, the, the uh, most basal part of the Paleogene. And one of the things that we are very lucky is because we have the only Denian in the Southern Hemisphere represented in uh, Patagonia. So are these flora contain lineages that now survive South America, Asia, Africa, as well as Australasia? Do they document the early phases of South American isolation by showing a loss of Gongwana taxa and increasing the new world taxa? Are evolutionary processes, processes registered in the fossil record? So this is something that we attempt to answer, not today it will be impossible for me to answer all those questions, but we are working towards answer them. So the journey starts much before we get to the, to the field. So first we start collecting information and checking geological maps here in my library. Then if we are lucky enough that United doesn't cancel my flight from Ithaca, I'm able to arrive to New York and from there I fly all the way to Buenos Aires. From Buenos Aires I fly again to a small town called Trelew where my colleagues from the Museo Paleontologico Ejido Feruglio, or MEF, are housed, and that's where I spend most of my time when I go to Argentina before leaving to the field. If you go to Trelew, you have the chance to stop in the uh, touring club. This uh, is the touring club uh, in around nine, uh, nine 1900s, this is today. And there is where Bachka City and the Sundance Kid stay. You can stay in the room, it charges you a little extra money. <laughs> you can sit also at the table where George Simpson writes some of his books. He was a visitor there for several years in the 30s. And finally, you can also sit at the table where uh, Antoine Exane Exupéry wrote part of the Little Prince book. So you can do all those things when you go to Trelew, plus work in the collections. <laughs> so what do we do? Uh, we work at the collections first, we check numbers, uh, we also get ready to go to the field, so we carry everything, we carry from the water, food, um, before leaving from the field, we take pictures, of course, <laughs> and we drive and drive. Sometimes we get into situations where uh, it's dubious if you can pass with the track or not. We were able to after three days. If the track breaks, uh, there's not a shop. You need to come up to the occasion and everybody works to try to fix the track. 
Lucky enough, you can maybe arrive on time to set your tent, which it will be your house for the next 15 days. And then if the wind doesn't blow, <laughs> that's the tent where you will have, hopefully, some dinners and lunches, maybe. Now, we never go out of the field without having a dinosaur detector, <laughs> as was suggested by uh, the people in Jurassic Park. And actually, we keep an eye open uh, if we see bones. We were very lucky to find not too long ago uh, bones of uh, the la one of the largest dinosaurs uh, in, um, in Patagonia and on the earth. So concentration, we are working in many different uh, paleofloras. I will just mention three of them today because these are the most spectacular ones. I will be talking about La Colonia Formation, which is that one that is in the KPG boundary, is the mas companion to Maastrichtian in age. The Salamanca Formation, which is Danian, that puts us in the early Paleocene, around 65 million years ago. And then the Tufolita Laguna de Lunco, which is basically a tuff. They were just tuff. It's just ashes and ashes and ashes. Uh, the Tufolitas Laguna de Lunco is compared to the, uh, what you have in Yellowstone. It's considered to be one of the largest mega calderas for the Eocene worldwide. And that, uh, the age of that uh, Tufolita is Ipresian, which is an early Paleocene. So basically, what we are looking is from La Colonia to the Salamanca to the Tupolitas Laguna de Luco, and here is where you will have the KPG boundary. This is just, I don't want to overwhelm you with uh, geology, but this is just for, to show you how the southern hemisphere look in polar view during a specific time. So this is around the Maastrichtian. And as you can see, we have a still a Gongwana start to break around the Jurassic, but major movements uh, started uh, from the Triassic all the way to modern times. So here is uh, the reconstruction for uh, the Maastrichtian. This is a brief reconstruction for the Danian, one for the Eocene, which is the Ipresian, and finally, this is today's reconstruction. One of the things that I want to point it out here is that at this point, this point and these points, we didn't have the circumpolar current. So the temperature at that point was still high. So when we hit the Eocene, what we are hitting is the maximal thermal during the tertiary. And that is important because it's when we start to change different type of taxa. And we will see that in a minute. Once we are in the field, we continue driving. We drop the cars there and then we walk to the sediments where we will be collecting. Uh, it's not easy. It's not vacation time like most people think. We carry heavy machinery to <coughs> break the rocks. Uh, in this case, you can see here, we have a rotary saw. Uh, once we have what is called a quarry, which is the place where we work at where fossils, we do a lot of on-hand activities, just as using the pick and shovels and cleaning the quarry. We obtain rocks and we pick the rocks, we divide the rocks, we clean the fossils, we select the fossils in the field, we pack them, and finally, we leave a clean quarry for the following day. Having a clean quarry helps you to do paleoecological studies. We take every single fossil that, every single fossil that we excavate is recorded. That allow us to do physiognomic analysis, which basically allow us to calculate maximum temperatures and also based on those characters, we also are able to uh, produce maximal temperature and uh, rain. So these studies are really important. So what are the metals that we use? Uh, obviously, uh, the fossils are collected, we take it to the uh, collections, and there the fossils are prepared. We use the standard methods, depends on the fossils, we do it by hand, sometimes we have uh, little tools that help us to do that. Uh, you will see later on, sometimes we are able to obtain 
pollen grains in situ, so that those are studied with TEM and SEM as well. And um, we uh, try to include all our fossils within a phylogenetic context. So basically what we do is a total evidence approach. For this, we uh, use matrices that have already provided, that had already published. If they are not, we produce our own morphological matrices. We combine those with molecular data that we obtain from gene bank and other sources. <coughs> and sometimes we find that we need some key taxa that needs to be explored for the relationship. We even do our own extraction of DNA. Uh, these are just uh, some of the things that we use. Uh, we use maximum parsimony and we use, uh, use a maximum likelihood on all our uh, projects. Sometimes fossils cannot be included and we don't. So the methodology that we use is basically to go to herbarium sheet, compare what do we have there and try to figure it out where we can place these fossils in what families. So we do a lot of a modern, uh, modern taxonomy or systematics of these groups. So La Colonia formation outcrops in the Somuncura massif is considered to be upper Cretaceous. And one of the things that is important is for all the, the formations that we present today, we have a very good determined DH. So the age in this case is 65 to 83, it based on many chronostratigraphic markers. Uh, so we know that the uh, formation is 72 million years old. Uh, it has three different facies, which means three different types of environments where the fossils were deposited. And what is uh, important here is that all our fossils come from the lower and middle facies, which are represented by coastal freshwater lakes or fresh water lagoons. And I will not show you all the fossils today, but I want to make sure that is one of um, the fossils that we have uh, found there are represented by the family Saldiniesi, uh, which is a aquatic fern. Dixoniesi is also ferns. We have several conifers, but the most prominent one are from the family Araucariesi. Uh, we have the first and oldest record of Nelumbolesi, which is an aquatic uh, plant. Uh, we have palms, the family Arecaceae, and we have Tifaceae, also is considered to be an offshore kind of, of plant. We have several dicots and monocot leaf morphotypes. We are working on that. But also we have an extremely rich palinoflora, which is basically pollen grains and spores. So uh, I will show you just a couple of, of examples. And I'm very proud of the Azola because this is the oldest record worldwide of a whole plant. That means we have the sporophytes and we have the sporocarps. And those inside the sporocarps, uh, this is the plant. This is one of the sporocarps. We were able to pull out the megaspores. And each megaspore has stick to it the microspores, and those microspores are represented by these little things here. And this is a specific type of extension of the wall called the glochidia. The glochidia are fundamental for the microspore to reach the floaters of the megaspores and then uh, copulate. Marsiliaceae is uh, also an aquatic fern. They are, it's a very small family with three genera. And we have here, this is represented a very close to the genus Mar Marsilia, which has four leaflets. We have the four leaflets here. And in this case, we also find the uh, sporocarp. And Regnelidium, which is only, uh, is endemic of uh, a small area in Brazil, Uruguay, and Argentina, uh, has a rich fossil record in the northern hemisphere, not in the southern hemisphere. However, we found it in La, oops, we found it in La Colonia with the two leaflets. And these sporocarps yield the megaspores, which are called molaspora when you find it that is not associated, and crispeleporitis, which are these ones here. So um, 
these are uh, the oldest records for the family Marsiliaceae worldwide. The Salamanca formation belongs to a completely different formation and basin is the San Jorge Basin. We know that is Denian is really well established the age, is the only southern hemisphere Denian sediments, uh, is represented by estuarine deposits. And one of the things that we know is that has a, one of the most fantastic uh, invertebrate flora, um, invertebrate fauna, and among them is one of the reaches for insects. It also has a rich uh, palinoflora, but the megaflora is almost unknown. And that is because we have a lot of angiosperm morphotypes. Those are the ones that we don't know where to put them. Um, the formation was discovered many, many years ago, but it's still we started uh, sampling around the 2007. And that's where we got the oldest record for the RKC represented by the uh, Atellini subtribe. These are the seeds, those are, I'm sorry, those are actually the fruits. You can see here, they have the three bulbs, they have only two pores, and these are the seeds. We extend distribution of the Atellini is this area northern part of, uh, Argentina. And again, we did a phylogenetic analysis and is placed within the clade of the Atellini. We also, uh, this is work with my, uh, with Nathan, my, actually my postdoc at this time. So here we have uh, the oldest record of Rhamnesi worldwide as well. It's a flower and is characterized by as being pentamerous. They have a very distinctive type of uh, calyx. They have the cuculate and marginate petals, uh, petals. And um, the family is today well distributed, but the fossil record is now very abundant. Again, we included a phylogenetic context and it fits within the sisyphoids, which are found today in the, uh, in the Americas. We have also found Cunoniesi, uh, which is a typical Southern Hemisphere family. Uh, in Argentina, we have only four genera, Clacrubia, Eucryphia, Lamanonia, and Weimania. And we have this one, this flower, that varies the number of uh, parts. Uh, the sepals are three and have uh, a very distinctive type of um, venation. But the most important thing are the petals, which are here. And this is characteristic of one of the groups within the, uh, within the family, and is the SQCAC. And we found the pollen grains within the anthers. Again, we included a phylogenetic context and is placed as a sister of the crown group Epschisomeri. And this is important because later on I will show you another fossil that belongs to the same group. Another Cunoniesi, this is Cunoniatha bicarpellata, and again, we found the distinctive uh, Cunoniesi morphology. We found the pollen grains in situ here, and these are the pollen grains of uh, Weimania and Calcluvia, which are two of the uh, genera that grows in Argentina today. And again, it was included in the phylogenetic context, and this one fits as the core, in the base of the core of the whole Cunoniesi. What are the Tufolitas Laguna de Lunco? That's considered to be one of the largest volcanic pyroclastic complex worldwide. Uh, the fossil comes from tufaceous mats, and these are representing caldera-like deposits, exactly the same as if today Yellowstone will uh, erupt. We know exactly the age, 52 million years uh, ago. And this is actually one of the highest paleobiotas uh, worldwide and is the uh, highest, is the richest Eocene floras worldwide, even comparing with the United States. We have found pteridophytes, gymnosperms, and several angiosperms. And these are some of the gymnosperms as uh, Retrophilum in the Podocarpaceae, Popoa cedrus, 
uh, Agatis in the Araucariaceae. Agatis is totally extinct in Argentina. It's only uh, found in uh, certain areas of Australasia. Uh, we have Gingoides, and this is the cuticle, as you can see here. This is the last record of Gingoides worldwide, and this is the one that gave origin to the uh, Gingos, as we know today. And then we have Austrosamia, uh, which is in the Cicadaceae. Uh, among those, we found the oldest record of eucalyptus. And one of the things that is important is we have a whole plant there. We have the leaves with the typical type of venation. We have the fruits that are the capsules that have the bulbs. Uh, and we have flowers. And within the flowers, we were able to obtain pollen grains. And these pollen grains are what, if you find them isolated, as Myrtiacidides eucalyptoides. And this is the uh, type that is considered to be the precursor of the genus Eucalyptus or Eucalyptus. So again, we uh, included in a phylogenetic context. This is isolated Myrtiacidides. And as we can see, the Patagonian fossils are placed within the genus Eucalyptus. This is the other Cunoniesi that we found. This is, remember, this is tertiary. This belongs again to the uh, sub or to the tribe Eschizomeri. These are the, the fruits. We have other Cunoniesi that are being studied at this point, but as you can see, this is modern Weimania. These are characterized by having these uh, capsules that open with two bulbs and they have the remnants of the uh, styles. And you can see this one is one of those with this typical opening with the stars. And we have another one here. These are totally two different type of fossils. This is the typical panicle, and this is a typical racine. So we know that Cunoniesi was much more diverse than what we have today in uh, living. Uh, we have also fossils of the Juglandaceae. Uh, these are uh, character. These are fruits. They are nutless, and these allow us to actually, uh, we did a CT scan to actually observe that the uh, embryos and the cotyledons are separated in four, and they are together. That's key to determine if these belong to Juglandaceae or not. Again. We include it in a phylogenetic context and it fits within the Engelgardioidae. And Engelgardioidae are represented today in the northern part of South America and Central America. There's not in uh, Argentina. And of course, we have Solanaceae that was uh, really important because uh, Solanaceae are mostly herbaceous things. Uh, they are very important uh, group for crops, uh, but we found this uh, beautiful preserve very similar to the modern, some of the modern genera, and in this case, very similar to the fruits that are produced by Pisalis. Um, the family is today uh, worldwide distributed. We know that the origin of the family is uh, the, uh, this uh, uh, South America. And uh, one of the things is that we were able to infer that probably they were distributed, uh, they were dispersed by the rivers because these have the syndrome of the uh, floating calyx. Again, we place it, I don't expect for you to read this, but we place it here within the core physalis. So we have actually northern connections and south connections. Southern connection. So in the northern connection, this is the, uh, actually this is the Maastrichtian, that's how you will see it. We have Regnelidium, we have the Marsilia, uh, the Azola, we have grains of, this is actually Sparganiaceae polenaires, which is a dead fish. Uh, we have Aresi, this is the oldest record, this is a, the genus Pandanitis. Uh, which is an Aracy. This is proving actually that we find also the uh, mega fossils. Those are aquatic plants. And of course, we have Notophagididas. We have Southern Connection is indicated also by this fern. This is the genus Todia. Uh, we have Agatis in the Araucariaceae. We have the Juglandaceae. 
We have gymnostoma, which is casuarin acid. Today, this is totally extinct in Argentina and only grows in certain parts of Australasia. We have the eucalyptus, and we have uh, several cunoniaceae. So based on this information, what we can say actually is that we can observe certain uh, evolutionary processes such as extinction. We don't have agatis or eucalyptus or castorinaceae anymore in South America. However, they are, all of those are represented by the oldest records in the Eocene of Argentina. We have also an expansion. We have the salvinellis, those are the aquatic ferns. We have the araceae, we have notophagaceae, cunoniaceae, and proteaceae, which have expanded based on the fossil record to other areas of South America and the Southern Hemisphere. We have definitely retraction of several taxa, such as arecaceae. Remember, if we have here the palms and now they are restricted to this area, they are really retracted. Based on uh, palynology, we can say the same about the family Rubiaceae. And finally, there are several things that are explaining disjunction models, such as the family Winteraceae and Araucariaceae, which have uh, disjunct. We have some of those in the northern part of Argentina and some in the south. So, in summary, I want to make sure that you know that actually fossils are really critical and they provide an unprecedented wealth of information, not only on Cretaceous and tertiary floras, but also if we compare them with extant floras to understand certain things. They provide knowledge on past southern distribution, which is critical for understanding modern global distribution. If you remember the first slide, I said there was an asymmetry in the uh, latitudinal gradients of diversity. So this is proving that that is actually occurring. These paleofloras are certain relevant for explaining modern high diversity centers. And evolutionary processes are really detected in the paleofloristic record of Patagonia. And for all of you, we actually, we need to celebrate the past to awaken the future. And that is because we actually, uh, genomic information is extremely important uh, molecular data is critical, but also we have the other component. So we have, if we don't study the taxonomy, past distribution, modern distribution, we are missing a lot of critical information that help us to understand actually the value of that genomic and molecular data. With that, I say thank you. Um, this uh, has been um, funded by several agencies. Uh, NSF, MEF, uh, Fulbright, and CONICET. Um, nothing of this can be done without the staff of the museum and people here. Uh, Cornell has a fantastic um, herbarium, which I use quite frequently. Uh, we cannot do this work if we didn't have access to all of our, um, our sites and to my two beacons. Thank you. Questions? Yes. The, the pictures of the fossils are so beautiful. Can you briefly tell us how you go from finding a rock to making those pictures? <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a task. So first of all, we really clean them. Uh, so that in, in the field, we, we get the big rocks and we treat them there. So we don't carry all that, that way to the, to the field. Uh, these collections are approximately, Laguna de Lunco has more than 8,000 specimens total. So what we do later is when we get into the lab, uh, we trim them again and we have special tools to treat them two-dimensionally. And then if possible, we wash them with water. And after that, we just put it under cameras and take the pictures. Oh, it varies, it varies. We have things that are this thick and we have things that are this thick. It just depends. Yeah. So could you go back to the slide with the, the sort of your summary that had the map and pushing in the different directions? I want to spend a little bit more time looking at that. 
Oh, oh no. sorry. Okay. Let. Yeah, yeah. I can. I can. I go all the way down, <laughs> and then I go here. And yeah, no, no, no. It's there. So, yeah. So I was thinking about the the expansion. Um, you in, in particular. Yeah. So do you see? Um, okay, in the new construction. So in the expansion, do you see any sort of uh, strong directionality as to? Um, the, the north south direction we do okay we do actually and uh, i of course i don't have the time to explain all this so what's happened is uh based on the position of uh patagonia during this time it was still connected to antarctica so what we are doing is actually we are missing all the record for antarctica now uh, the peninsula and several of the islands that are close to the Antarctic Peninsula during the summer, you can go and collect. So that's the next step. There are very few works that have been done there. It started in the 1900s with the um, trips of Northern Hall with the boat called the Antarctica. Uh, he was, uh, his, his father was a geologist. So early on in his life, although he was a person that was interested in hunting whales, and that's why they did the trip with the Antarctica, uh, they were interested, he was interested in collecting rocks. So he collected actually a bunch of fossils that are considered now today the holotype for the oldest records for Nothophagus. Those were studied in Sweden by, uh, North, uh, by uh, Dusen, which is a very famous paleobotanist. So there are material there and we are trying to to get to it so if everything goes okay maybe in a couple of years i will be going there and collect and those we the nice thing about this is yes. that the uh, we will have the whole sequence uh from the maastrichtian all the way actually to the miocene there are very interesting things happening here uh and we have miocene floras two big floras uh in tierra del fuego and those are critical because that's when almost all the species of Nothophagus are recorded. So the Nothophagus goes this way, but um, we actually, the oldest record is pollen grains from the Maastrichtian of um, Antarctica. Can I ask another question? Of course. So, so then when do you start to see the current um, habitats coming in? Because it looks like it just it just depends so the 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 last big thing that appeared were the andes that they started to elevate during the miocene and at the end is when we start to see uh, already the arid area uh, already the diagonal already established so uh, still um, the biggest changes are mostly observed after the uh, PTEM, the Paleocene-Eocene Thermal Maximum. That's when the geological aspects, that's when the current, the Antarctic current is start to be more prominent. So it's when during the Oligocene, you start to observe the curve already, the temperatures start to go down. And at the beginning of the Oligocene is when you start to see the glaciation in Antarctica. So all those things are affecting what you are getting into the uh, into Patagonia, and this is only this is based not only in the data I presented today. Of course, there are many many um, uh, examples. So, we, for example, with the Nothophagus, we start to observe when Nothophagus appears. Also, Mesodendrosis start to appear, and we know that Mesodendrum is actually uh, symbiotic with Nothophagus, it grows only on Nothophagus. So we start to observe as well those kind of uh, events. Yes? So very interesting is something the aliens, of course. Uh, so you, you saw almost all the major clades yes. in Patagonia. So I think the diversification of that order happened in Patagonia. We, this, has, this is actually kind of uh, new. And one of the things is um, Southern Hemisphere is considered to be extremely undersampled. And there are many biases why this is occurring. First, again, is uh, oceanic is not considered to be continental. So there's not too many land where you can go and look for fossils. 
Then there's, uh, for example, you have Africa. Africa is almost, doesn't have almost any sedimentary rocks, which is where you find the fossils. And then, until not too many years ago, uh, nobody was interested in what was happening in the Southern Hemisphere because you could explain everything, studying things in the Northern Hemisphere. Actually, the uh, original, original paleobotanists uh, were from the Northern Hemisphere. So the way that these floras were collected until the 50s, was based on uh, oil companies. So they send the geologists to prospect for oil, they collect some fossils, they bring them to the United States and they study them. So uh, until the 50s, that was the methodology. After the 50s, 1950s, the thing started to change and uh, more people was more involved in other aspects of uh, paleobotany, not just you know indicators of uh, oil. Uh, so we are, trying to collect. We expect that we will find actually uh, more interesting things. For example, we have the genus Paleoazola. And um, Paleoazola has actually three megaspores that we consider that are viable. And without any doubt, it belongs to Salvinielis. It belongs, it's, a, it's an aquatic firm. So there are all those things that we still need to experiment with. Thank, Thank you so you much. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.